I do believe that I am live on Facebook. And so, <clears throat> hello to everybody on Facebook. I've got to get my Insta going. Instagram, Instagram. All right, tonight, as you know, is No More Genies. And uh, I know if this is your first time hearing me or seeing me, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So I'll explain it briefly. And that is that. We have, unfortunately, when I say we, I mean, especially those of us in the West, have developed a genie concept of God, a magic concept of God, where we think all we have to do is rub the lamp or say the magic words or do some stuff like that. And then somehow God will just do what you want him to do or some foolishness like that, that we have, we have adopted and it's what I call a genie concept of God, where you think that faith is magic, where you think that it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter what you say, it's my sister, it doesn't matter what you believe, that you can just rub the lamp or snap your fingers or say the magic words, and God will somehow just magically do what you want. Uh, and that is wrong, that is wrong. That is part of the false prosperity gospel. There's no such thing as prosperity gospel because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. There's no one that followed God that did not ultimately prosper. That's not possible to obey God and not prosper, even if you have to go through hard times in the middle. So there's no, no such thing as prosperity gospel, but there is such a thing as the false prosperity gospel. And that's what we've gotten used to in the West. The false prosperity gospel says it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter what choices you make. It doesn't matter how you think. It doesn't matter what you confess. And it doesn't matter what you believe. You can still get a full benefit package from God, regardless of what you bring to the table. That's a lie. <laughs> That's the false prosperity gospel. So once that got introduced into religion in America, people just started jumping on it because of course they would, because it, 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 it minimized and cut out the message of repentance the message of you having to change, change your mind, you having to take up your cross and obey God and not your flesh and obey God and not yourself. So of course people ate that up. So now, you know, people talking about prosperity and they're talking about, you know, physically increase, nothing wrong with that. Talking about money, nothing wrong with that. I'm gonna talk about that tonight. We're supposed to have that, but that comes through faith and obedience. The Bible says that through faith and patience, they inherited the promises of God. They believed God and they had to be patient, okay? You have to hang in there and keep doing what the Lord tells you to do until he tells you something new, that kind of thing. So the false prosperity gospel tells you that all you have to do is treat God like, you know, you're shooting craps, come on, Jesus, <laughs> and throw them dice or rub the lamp and say the magic word, and then the Lord's just gonna do everything you want all day, no. No, no, he's not a genie. God don't follow us. We follow him. God does not bow down before us. We bow down before him. Okay? We don't lead God. He leads us. You understand? Oh, there's Erica. Hey, Erica. And so that's the false prosperity gospel. That's the gospel that Americans have, have bought into hook, line, and sinker. And that's why you have so many people now trying to justify things that aren't even in the Bible. It's why you have so many things that are, so many people that are making up things and they're making up things and calling it God because they think that God has to honor whatever choice you make. God has to 
you know, like he's a genie, like somehow you own him, like somehow he's a slave, like somehow it doesn't matter how you live. All that is wrong. So that's why I started my second Thursday night broadcast. I come on once a month on the second Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time because we are going to deal with getting rid of this genie concept of God where you think that faith is magic and God is some kind of genie. Oh, that's wrong. So that's what No More Genies is about. So I got a hot message tonight and I'm excited about it. So let's jump on in. Thank you, Lord for one more time to come before you, oh God. Thank you, God, that you are always there and available to us. Thank you, Lord, that you are our rock, that you are, are our fortress, that you are stable, that there's no shadow of turning with you, that you are God on high and beside you there is no other. I worship you, I laud you, I magnify you, I bless your name, I lift you up, I declare and decree that you are God all by yourself and that you have no peer and that you don't have to counsel with anyone but I glorify you and I call your name great. And I call your heart and yourself and your essence love. And I call you holy. And I call you all the beautiful things that you are. I agree with you, oh God, with everything you said about yourself. So I must decrease so you can increase, oh God. So I take up my cross right now. Please fill me with the Holy Ghost. Forgive me for any sin. I take a cross in my flesh, oh God, because I want you to breathe through me. Every word spoken, I want it to be what you want spoken. So you can receive the glory in all things. So the saints can receive edification. So the demons will be cast out and strongholds will be broken and bloodline curses will be no more. And so that unbelievers will see your power and see your love and see your greatness and realize they don't want to live one more day without you. So I thank you for it. And I believe you for it. I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word tonight. And we're looking for you to do great things. It's in Jesus' name we pray and believe and decree. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. Tonight's No More Genies, number 38. This is the 38th installment of this series I've done, by the way. Is entitled, It's Time for Refreshing. Put that on the screen. It's time for refreshing. It's time for refreshing. Okay. Now, what is that talking about? Let's look at our core scripture. Our core scripture that we're going to talk about is found in Acts uh, 3, and I'm actually going to read uh, 19 and 20. Uh, the core scripture is Acts 3, 19, but I'm actually going to read uh, 19 and 20. Here's Acts 3, 19 and 20 in the New International Version. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. In the King James Version, that says, repent ye therefore, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. What's that got to do with us now? Well, my sister ministered a little bit on this on Sunday, and I was there to uh, see her minister, and the Lord has given me some more revelation on that, and that's what I'm going to share with you tonight to help break up that genie magic concept of God. Let's look at those scriptures. Let's look again. <clears throat> the first word in Acts 3.19 is repent. Good God Almighty. That's just what I was talking about in my intro. I want you to think, think with me. I want you to think about how many times in the last year you've heard a spiritual leader use the word repent. Bishops, deacons, elders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. How many times in the last year have you heard a spiritual leader in the kingdom of God use the word repent? It's in the Bible, okay, but it seems to be strangely missing quite often from our language these days. But I'm so glad that the Word of God does not change, and I'm so glad that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost do not change. So if you don't know what repent means, repent does not mean to stop doing something. Uh, the stopping of doing something 
The stopping of doing something is a result of repentance. Repentance means to change your mind specifically towards God. So in other words, when you see the Bible, the English word repent, what it means is change your mind from the way you were thinking and change your thoughts towards what God wants you to think. That's what it means to repent, to change your mind. Okay, so the Bible says, change your mind. In NIV, it says, and turn to God. In King James, it says, and be converted. Now, there again is exactly what I was talking about in the intro. You have to change your mind, and then you got to change your ways. So that's why we have to get rid of this genie concept where we've been become convinced that it doesn't matter how we live, that we can just live any kind of way we want to. That's not what the Bible teaches. This is Peter talking. Repent then and turn to God. Repent ye therefore and be converted. In other words, become born again and adopt a born again lifestyle so that your sins may be wiped out, NIV, that your sins may be blotted out, King James Version. Now I've explained that many times, but it bears repeating here. <clears throat> the reason that Jesus had to die on the cross was because sin must be dealt with by a holy God. God is love, but God is also holy. His holiness and his justice requires that, that uh, sin be dealt with, and the, the penalty of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Sin also pays wages. So in other words, what sin will pay you if you engage in it is death. So that has to happen. It has to be dealt with. So what Jesus did was he substituted for the death that we deserve on the cross. So, so whenever you see a picture of Christ on the, on the cross, understand there's one thing, that's supposed to be you. So the Lord stepped in and said, I will take the penalty for them. I will take the penalty in my body. I will suffer, bleed and die for what they have done wrong. So once the Lord uh, allowed his body to be broken and once the Lord shed his blood, then Father God in heaven can take the blood of Jesus because there's no sin in it, it's pure blood. And the first thing he can do is he can wipe the sins off your account. So in other words, your record in heaven, Father takes the blood of Jesus when you convert and become born again and applies that blood to your account and whatever sins you've committed, Father God wipes them out. But that's not the only part. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in other words, Father God then takes the blood of Jesus and applies it to your spirit and cleanses you from that old behavior. So that's why when you're saved and born again, you don't have to live like you did before you got saved because God will cleanse you of those thoughts and God will cleanse you of that life. So that's what Peter is saying here. Peter is saying, change your mind and turn towards God. So then God can, once you get born again and you accept Jesus Christ, as you're saying, and Lord, God can wipe those sins off your account. If you don't get saved, that means after you die, you're gonna stand before a holy God with all of your sins on your account. Now, I want you to think back as far as you can remember. I want you to think back even to the lies you told as a child. I want you to think back for any time you took something, even as a child, that you didn't pay for. I want you to think back anytime you bore false witness, you said somebody did something that they didn't do, trying to cover for your behind. Think back, think back, okay? All that is still on your record if you ain't saved. I'm talking about going back to childhood and all that you're gonna have to answer for after you die in judgment if you never accepted Jesus' a broken body and shed blood as payment. That's why I know people don't understand. This is three-dimensional, this is real. This is real life. This is not ethereal, this is not spooky. This is not going by and by to some pie in the sky when you die. This is life and death. So Peter says, we need to change our minds, turn towards God, and then God will blot out our sins and wash us clean. And then <clears throat> in the NIV, it says that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. King James Version, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, what you need to understand about that is, well, let me read this. Let me read Genesis 8 and 22. Now, this is God talking right after the flood. 
So this has to do with the floodwaters of Noah. Genesis 8 and 21 says, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, that's the sacrifice on the altar that Noah built after they came out the ark. He said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from his youth. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Verse 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall never cease. So God promised after the flood, after he smelled the sacrifice that Noah had, had made after they came out the ark, God said, even though we ain't no good, God said, I'm not going to do this again. I'm never going to destroy. I'm never going to curse the ground because of us. And I'm never going to destroy all living creatures by water as I have done. Then God says in verse 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall never cease. That's why you can count on the seasons because it is a declaration, a decree of God that as long as the earth's here, we're going to have seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night. God said, I'm not going to wipe y'all out no more like that by water. Okay. What's that got to do with what we're talking about tonight? I've discovered a lot of people don't understand that seasons exist on every level. So there are seasons in the natural, the things we just read, that there's time to plant seeds and then time to harvest. Sometimes it's hot, like it's been, this has been a very hot summer. Sometimes it's uh, cold. We have summer, we have winter and winter, the earth shuts down, it's cold, nothing's growing. Okay, so you, we understand those seasons in the natural, but there are also seasons in your life. And there are also seasons in the spirit. So the concept of the season is not just for the natural seasons, the weather that we experience. There are times in the spirit where the Lord is doing certain things. There are times when it's a seed time, time in the spirit where God will tell you to sow. And God will tell you to sow very specific things to very specific places. He may or may not tell you the reasons what you're sowing into, but he will tell you to sow. There are times where God uh, has you in the winter season where God tells you to rest. No work. Get some sleep. Rest. This is not the time to till the ground. This is the time to chill. No pun intended. Uh, day and night. There are times where God says, work while it's day because the night comes when nobody can work. So if you're in a night season, we just got out of a night season with the pandemic where a whole lot of people weren't working for a very long time. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, that seasons exist on multiple levels, not just the natural seasons. And that's why it's so important, like you hear me say every week, that's why you need the prophetic in your life. Because we got a whole lot of people out here running around, don't know what season they in. <laughs> You understand that? Do you understand how much bad shape, how bad of a shape you are actually in if you don't know where you are in relationship to Christ? If you don't know where you are in relationship to God, if God is someplace and God, there's something God wants you to do and there's something God is trying to teach you and something God is trying to tell you with a particular season and you just don't get it, you just, just don't know where the Lord is, you don't know what's going on, Lord have mercy. So it's very important to have the prophetic in your life so you can get a prophetic word from God so you can ask God, what season am I in? Where are you in my life right now, Lord? <clears throat> what is it you're trying to teach me? What is it you want me to do? What am I supposed to be doing right now? If people did that, we would live more victorious lives. What we tend to do is kind of run off and do what we want. And then after we've created a mess, then we start crying to God and asking him to, to help fix it after we've already made certain choices. The better approach, which is why you need to be taught this kind of stuff as a child, is before you enter into any season, before you enter any stage of life, before you make any decision that you go before the Lord and ask the Lord, go before the Lord as a child, say to God, God, I am eight years old. What am I supposed to be doing now? Okay, and you're not gonna stay eight, eight years later, you're gonna be 16. Go before God and say, God, I'm 16 years old. I'm looking forward to driving this year, but what do you want me to do? What, what is this time of my life supposed to be about? Most people don't do that. That's why we get into so much trouble. And let me tell you something about being a teenager. Every bad habit that you build between the ages of 13 and 19 
If you live to see 40, you're going to be trying to get rid of it. All in bad habits, poor sleep, bad diet, lots of fornication, lots of liquor, lots of drugs, lots of porn, lots of overeating, lots of profanity, lots of smoking cigarettes, all that stuff that you think is so cool between the ages of 13, 13 and 19 and all the stuff you do just to rebel, just to rebel against God, just to rebel against your parents, just to go through your ain't nobody going to tell me what to do phase, that kind of thing. All them bad habits that you build of like being bad with money. Let me add that in there too. All them bad habits that you build between 13 and 19, if you live to see 40, you're going to be trying to get rid of them. I guarantee you. There's not one bad habit you built as a teen that if you live to see 40, you ain't going to be trying to get out of your life. It's the most amazing thing. See, because mo we don't go before the Lord and ask him, what season am I in? What am I supposed to be doing now? Okay. So having said all that, let's look again at our core scripture. Because there's some good stuff in here. Because what the Holy Ghost wanted me to talk about tonight, part one, was the times of refreshing. The times of refreshing from the Lord. The times of refreshing. That word there, refreshing, uh, uh, it says refreshing in English coming out of the Greek. It means a refreshing refreshment, a recovery of breath or revival. One more time. It means refreshing, a refreshment, uh, uh, a recovering of breath, a recovering of breath or revival. So God is saying that this is the eighth month and eight is the number of new beginnings. Now, if you don't know it, the Bible is built on a very specific numerical system because there is spiritual meaning to every one of the numbers that there is. Like one is the number of God because one means self-sustaining, that God is God all by himself. That's why also why God is always first because his number is one. Two is the number of witness. So when you want to establish something, you need two people to testify to it. Three is number of perfect witness, meaning that if the same thing coming out of three people's mouths, <laughs> okay, that's an accurate witness. Uh, that's why there's three witnesses when Jesus got coronated, Father spoke from heaven, the Holy Ghost descended like a dove, and John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Three people or three entities giving testimony that Jesus was Messiah, that's the number of perfect witness. Four is the number of foundation because of the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the earth, and anything that can sit four square is pretty much the most stable shape we have. So four is the number of foundation. Five is the number of grace. Five represents the fivefold ministry of God, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Five uh, represents grace. Grace is an, an acronym for God's riches at Christ's expense. So in other words, Father God opened his hand and gave us Jesus. And through Jesus, we get the benefit of Jesus's life, even though he's the one that lived perfectly and we do not at all. But Father God uh, counts Jesus's righteousness. He adds that to our account when we believe in him. That ain't nothing but sheer grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So in other words, God said, I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. That's what five represents the number of grace. Six is the number of man because man was created on the sixth day. That's also why the mark of the beast is 666, if you didn't know that. The beast is the devil's son, like Jesus is God's son. And the spirit of the beast, the Antichrist, represents man trying to save himself apart from God. So six is always the number of man. And six always falls short because there's only so far we can go. And then you have to have a seven. Seven is the number of completion. Seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number where God can write it into something and say that it's finished. So that's why Jesus died on the cross for six hours to represent the sin of man, okay? But seven is the number of perfect completion. 
And God can draw a line underneath it and say, that's done. That's why we have seven days in a week. Okay. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Week. Saturday is the end of that week. Sunday is the first day of the next week. So what does eight mean? Eight is the number of new beginnings. Eight means that it's time to drop something new. Eight means that it's time to get a clean slate and either start over or start again or start afresh. So the Holy Ghost tell me, told me to say tonight that we are in a time and a month and a season of new beginnings. We are in a time of refreshment from the Lord, but I read all those verses to you to help you understand this for saved people. <laughs> a lot of unbelievers think that they can cash in on God's promises, but they have no covenant with God. God is the God of covenant. So I'm talking to believers. The Lord has his hand open to give us a time of refreshing or refreshment, but it also says a refreshing of breath. That means the Lord is going to breathe on us fresh. That means the Lord is going to put some new life in your body. He's going to put some new ideas in your head. He's going to put some new relationships in your life. He's going to open some new doors in front of you because it's the season for it. That's why I told you, no genie concept, because this don't happen all the time. <laughs> and because it doesn't happen all the time, that's why the smart thing to do is to take advantage of it while God has the door open. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. That's why you need the prophetic. So if God opens the door and says, now is the season of refreshment, then I want to be like a little bird in the nest waiting for mama to come back with the worm. Refresh me. You pour all that on me. I'll take all that. Okay? Because it's not going to be a season of refreshment forever. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. We are in the eighth month. And it's a time of refreshing. That means the Lord is going to breathe on you. You understand what that means? It means he's going to revive you. You know, people are always talking about revival. Your, your body can get tired. You know your body can get tired. Your mind and your soul can get tired. Your spirit can get tired too. So the Lord has to and bring you back to life. I just talked Sunday about Lazarus, about how the Lord brought him back to life. Remember when God first made us, he made us out of the clay and then he, he breathed into us the breath of life and we became a living soul. That's what God is doing now, breathing some more life into us. That's what season it is. That's why you need to take advantage of it. Why? Wow, that's what he's doing. Because whenever he get done with that, he's going to move on to the next. So that means you need to get while the getting is good. And that's why so many people have gotten off track. And that's why so many people that wanted to be married ain't married. You know why? Because they miss spouse season. There's such a thing as spouse season, if you didn't know that. There's such a time as where God releases the anointing for people to find the person they're supposed to marry. Did you know that? That don't happen all the time. <laughs> the last spouse season that I personally am aware of was uh, 2015. That's the last spouse season that summer. And I remember I gave a prophetic word to church about that. And a lot of people asked me about it later. They're like, what were you talking about? And then some friends of mine, well, Eric is on here now. Some friends of mine, uh, that I knew met their spouse or got married in 2015 because it was spouse season. Because when God declares and decrees that it's time for you to find the one you're supposed to build your family with, that is that spouse season. That means the anointing is there. That means the Holy Ghost is trying to guide you to them and try to guide them to you. That's that door don't stay open forever. And some people miss it. And some people go every month of year. What, what year is this? Uh, 2021? That's six years. Some people go six more years. Some people don't want to be married. You could have been married six years ago, but you missed it. And that's why it's so dangerous to be out of the will of God, because whatever the Lord is doing, he has to tell you what he's doing. You're not going to know. How would you know? You're not the Lord. The Lord has to tell you this is what I'm doing in this season. So you need to jump on it. See, yeah, you're talking about, right. Oh, this is Ryan. I'm going to run. Just run. We got married in 2015. That's right. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So when God tells you that this is the season for whatever it is he's doing, then the, the wise person, the wise Christian will say, yes, Lord, and don't argue with him. <laughs> 
You're not going to make God make it be whatever season you want. <laughs> Haven't you ever been in a situation where you just cried and cried out to the Lord? You cried out to the Lord. You prayed and you prayed. And I mean, you prayed, you prayed and you prayed. Looked like what you was dealing with didn't change. You know why? Because you don't tell the Lord what to do. Maybe God left that thing in your life because he was trying to bring something out of you that would not have come out of you any other way. So if he had listened to you and moved that thing, you never would have grown. But because he did what he knew was right, even though it wasn't comfortable or pleasant, it brought something out of you that he wanted to bring out of you. Because I'm a living witness. You can cry and cry and cry and pray and pray and pray. And if God is not saying that that thing is going to move or that thing is going to change, maybe God is saying, okay, you need to change. That thing's in your life because I'm trying to change you because it's the season where he's working on that in your life. You can't make it be the season you want it to be. That's why we have to listen to the prophetic through the Holy Ghost to ask the Lord, what season do you say it is? Let me get with that. Okay. And so the Holy Ghost is saying right now that it's a time of refreshing, that the Lord is breathing new life into us. That means uh, uh, I have some family members that are about to deliver some babies. Uh, some people need to, you know, find a spouse to get married. Some people are going to get some new business ideas. Some people are going to go back to school. You've been waiting to go back to school. You've been waiting for the door to open, waiting for the time to be right. God is saying, now's the time. So many things happening in the season of refreshing. So that's part one of what I needed to talk about. So understand of a surety to take advantage of this season of God. When God says it is time for refreshing, that means to open your mouth and let the Lord breathe on you. Like a little bird waiting for the mama bird to drop the food, just go before the Lord and just say, breathe on me, God. I wanna receive your refreshing. I wanna receive your breath. I wanna receive the breath of the Almighty. Good God Almighty. That is just part one. I told you I had some good news tonight. I told you it was hot tonight because that's just part one. Here come part two. The other thing that the Holy Ghost told me to talk about is the year of Jubilee. Good God Almighty. <clears throat> now, some people know what the year of Jubilee is and some people don't. Oh, there's my sister. Hey, sis. Both my sisters watching. I told you my sisters love me. I told you my sisters support me. I'm blessed. Okay. So <clears throat> the other thing that the Lord, uh, Holy Ghost, told me to talk about was a year of Jubilee. For those of you that don't know what the year of Jubilee is, um, see, uh, God uh, outlined Jewish culture in every way possible. And here's what I mean by that. There's no area of life that God didn't give the Hebrews a statute a judgment or a commandment. Uh, I'm 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 hurt and disappointed, but that's why I do my No More Genies broadcast. That so many Western Christians have have bought into what our country has taught us, which is compartmentalization. So, in other words, our culture tells us religion is over here, and money's over here, and sexuality is over here and your career is over here and your family's over here. Compartmentalization is what we believe in the West. That is not actually how life works. The way life works is God has something to say in every single area of your life. God has spiritual commands. God has mental commands for the mind. God has commands for the soul, your emotional self. God has dietary uh, commands and structures for the body, how you eat and exercise. God has social commands, how you treat your fellow man. God has career commands, how to find your purpose or your job or your work and what to do. And God has financial commands. And we have been taught Christianity through a Western filter. So now people think it's, a, it's compartmentalized. That's why you have some people that live one way on Sunday and they say, I go to church on Sunday and then the other six days of the week, they just do what they want to do. See, that's compartmentalization. You do not have a relationship with God. That's just religion. You do not understand God as a person. Uh, if you have children in the house, don't you see kids every day? Because they're people. 
God is a person. He's just not a man. He's just not a human. And so you do not understand God as a person. So you think a Christian is something I do. So I go to church, I check off my religious box. I did something good this week. I'm a good person. And then you go live any kind of way you want to until you come back to church on next Sunday. Lord, have mercy. I can't tell you how much I've seen that in my life. That's, that's just religion. That's why people like it so, because it's easy. Having religion is way easier than having an actual relationship with God. Because having a relationship with God is where you talk to him every day. You have to learn how to take up your cross every day. Every day you have to learn how to say, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, if you're struggling with your food or your diet uh, or your finances, whatever you're struggling with, God actually has commands. And so God gave the Hebrews commandments, statutes, and judgments for everything. I mean, if you're suing somebody, God told you who to marry and not to marry. There's a chapter in Leviticus about God says, avoid these kinds of relationships. This is not good. Um, God uh, has talked about the diet, uh, about stuff to avoid because of the way it impacts your body and stuff's not holy. And God was trying to show them how to be set apart from worldly people. So God outlined a full culture. Hebrew people have a calendar because their calendar is different from the Gregorian calendar that we use. I mean, he gave them a whole culture. And so many of us have learned Christianity through that compartmentalized frame. So now you don't understand that God has something to say about every area of your life. Well, the year of Jubilee is specifically speaking to no longer being a slave or an indentured servant. The year of G Jubilee is speaking to getting your property back. So in Hebrew culture, what happened was if they got in debt, and they couldn't pay their debt, they would have to serve the person that they owed. So in other words, because that's in the Old Testament a lot, the creditor is coming to take away my children, is what that one woman said to the prophet. So in other words, so you get in over your head financially and you can't repay what you owe. So now you have to work for that person. So if your debt is huge, you know, you might end up working for the rest of your life. And God said, no. God said, you don't have to be a slave or a servant for the rest of your life. God said that uh, if you've served, when we get to the year of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee is every 50th year. So God said, basically, if you've been in debt 50 years, that whatever you paid, that's enough. And another person just have to eat up the rest because you don't have to be no servant for your whole life. You don't have to be in debt. So God told the Hebrews not to be in debt. You don't have to be in debt for your whole life. If you ain't paid your debt off in 50 years of paying, then God said, then that other person just have to eat the loss. So in other words, if you paid them 75% of what you owe and you still owe them 25%, it's not like we do it in this culture because people will grind you down, mess up your credit report, do a whole bunch of stuff. God said, if you pay three quarters of what you owe in 50 years, the other person going to have to eat that 25% and you get to be set free and you get to have your property back and you get to move back into your house and you get to have your land back and you get to have your debts canceled based on what you paid up to that point. And if you didn't pay it off, then oh, well, too bad, so sad because you didn't spend 50 years paying them. Okay, that's the year of Jubilee. What a Holy Ghost said that right now we're coming into a year of jubilee where you can get your debts paid off you can get out from underneath the burden of debt where you can uh repossess your property where you can repossess your land it's that kind of time but listen to me carefully like everything else in scripture which is why you need the prophetic you have to do it the way the Lord is telling you to do it. Some people, when they hear the year of Jubilee preach, they just call off, haul off, and quit their job. Now, <laughs> you ain't supposed to quit your job if the Lord didn't tell you to quit your job. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You cannot get the full effect of the promises of God apart from a relationship with God. That's why I keep hitting this so hard. How many times, I've seen it many times in my life, how many times have you seen uh, Christians get preached, uh, so-called preach them happy? People preaching, and they shout at them, and they preached to people shouting, and was running around the church, and was crying, and snotting, and slinging oil, and rolling on the ground, and how many, sata, hikana, makana? how many times have you seen that? Okay? 
that's good. But if you don't do what the Lord told you to do, because that's individual. So in other words, God might tell you, uh, increase your giving. Or my son said, quitting your job by faith without a rainbow word is foolishness. That's right. You don't just jump up and quit your job. So God might tell you, you need to increase your giving. Or God might tell you, you need to increase your exercise and decrease your calories. Or God might tell you, you need to cut this thing out of your diet, but add this thing to your gut diet. Or God might tell you that some relationships you need to leave alone. Or God might tell you, it's time to move. God might tell you that there's actually some other place he wants you to live. That the space you've been living up, up to this point, it's time for a new space. Or God might tell you that business idea that I gave you five years ago, now's the time to launch the business. Now, I know that's right. I know that's right. I give you two personal experiences very, very quickly. Number one, there's some prophetic words the Lord gave me six years ago that he just gave me leave to release like last year. So sometimes the Lord drops something in your spirit. Sometimes the Lord just says something to you, but he said, now's not the time to say that. So sometimes you got to hold it until the, the Holy Ghost say, say it now. So you got to do it the way the Lord tells you to do it. Second thing I'll tell you is that there was uh, way back when I was uh, releasing my first round of books, there was one book I was going to release and the Lord stopped me and said, no, don't do that one. Do this one. I was like, are you sure? He said, yeah. So I released the book he told me to release instead of the book I had planned to release. And that book changed my life. I mean, literally changed my life and put me on the map as an author. And it, would, it wouldn't have happened if I had done what I wanted. So I had to take up my cross. I had to crucify my release schedule so that I could become obedient to the Lord's release schedule. And that book changed everything for me because I did what the Lord to, told me to do in the right season. You, I did all that through the rhema word. I did all that through the prophetic. Now, hear me carefully. You've heard me say this before. And sometimes people get what I'm about to say twisted. But listen to me carefully. The fact that God wants you to have a house is in the Bible. The house that God wants you to have is not in the Bible. So you can only discern which house is mine through the Holy Ghost. So let me repeat. There are three levels of word and you need all three. There's the written word, which is the Bible. There's the living word, which is Jesus. And there's the rhema word, which comes through the prophetic. The fresh breathe right now, what is God saying word? That's the rhema, okay? When Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that word there is rhema, not logos. Nobody in the Bible had the Bible. Stuff didn't start uh, getting written down until Moses, remember? Everything from Adam to Moses. Moses wrote all that down, spending all that time with God on the mountain. So things didn't start getting written down. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So things didn't start getting written down till Moses. Everybody in the Old Testament didn't have the Old Testament. They were living it. They did, however, have the Mosaic Law, okay, after Moses. And then everybody in the New Testament had the Old Testament but they didn't have the completed canon of scripture like we do. They didn't have the book of Acts because they were living the book of Acts. You see that? So you have to have all three. You have to have the written word of God, the Bible, so you can know what God has said because God gave all those people in the Bible, all those experiences with him and had it written down so we would know what the Lord says, so we would know how he thinks, so we would know how God responds to different situations so we can stand on scripture. That's the written word. But Jesus is the Bible turned into a person. And the Bible is Jesus turned into a book. So everything that the Bible is about is who the Lord is in person. And you have to know him and his voice and his ways. But then we're still not done. You've got the fresh breathe. What is God saying now? And that comes through the prophetic. Because you're, you're, the Lord's not going to tell you everything in your personal relationship. He ain't going to tell you everything. Something's going to come through other people. Something's going to come through other members of the body, which is why you have to have the prophetic. Okay? You have to listen to different ministries. You have to listen to the people the Holy Ghost tells you to listen to because there are different revelations. See, God doesn't give no one person all the revelation. Oh, my sister says you can't hear me. Can y'all hear me? Is that better? Is that better? Can you hear me? 
Oh, that's my thing on Instagram. Okay, Instagram should, my mic is here. Instagram should still be able to hear me. Can you hear me now? Uh, let me know on Insta. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's what I mean when I say, we can hear me. Okay, great. Facebook, good. Okay, Wanda, if you can't hear me on Instagram, uh, let me know again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, so God is speaking to us through all three levels of word, the written word, the Bible, the living word, Jesus, but the Lord is not going to tell you everything in your quiet time. The Lord does not give all the revelation to no one person. The Lord didn't even write the Bible that way. How can you, <laughs> how can you think that God gives it? You got to be, you got to stay away from people like that. People like that are dangerous. Stay away from people that tell you that God don't talk to nobody but them. What was God doing to run things on the earth before they were born? What's God going to do to run things on the earth after they die if God don't talk to or through nobody but them? Just think about it. Uh-huh. What about people on the other side of the world? Are you saying they can't hear God if they don't hear you? Just think about it. Japan is what, 14, 16 hours away from us? Are you saying that if you don't hear the great right reverend, if you don't hear the great prophet, if you don't hear the great Tommy Two-Tone toenail from Tennessee, if you don't hear him, you can't be saved. You can't hear from God. You can't get in the kingdom because God put everything on one person. God didn't put everything on nobody but Jesus. Okay, you got to stay away from these crazy religious people that think that don't nobody that God don't talk to nobody but them. That that can't nobody hear God but them. What you hear from God is your portion. Lord have mercy, I've been wanting to say that for a long time. <laughs> What you hear from God is your portion of revelation. What God gives me, he might not give my son. He's going to give my son another portion. What God gives me, he's not going to give my sister. He's going to give my sister another portion. But it all works together for his purpose. But God never gives no one person all the revelation. So that's why when you hear people talking crazy stuff like that, that you can't listen to nobody but them, mm, you're on your way to a cult. C-U-L-T, that is a cult that God don't talk to nobody but them. And you can't talk to nobody about your spiritual edification but them. And everybody that's not them is wrong. Really? Really? That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's a genie concept. That's a magic concept. That's why people get their lives all messed up going off on them cults. When you listen to one person tell you that they got all the revelation and you can't get right with God unless you come through me. That is a cult. I'm going to say it as many times as I possibly can. That is a cult. And you are in trouble when you hear somebody say that and you're in trouble when you think that. Rather, the way the kingdom of God works is God gives each member of his body their portion. If you're the eyes, you have revelation that the eyes need. If you're the elbow, you have revelation that the elbow needs. If you're the knee, you have revelation that the knees need. If you're the feet, you have revelation that the feet need. But if you need, when you need other revelation, you have to listen to other parts of the body. Okay, I'm not a pastor. So when I need shepherding, I have to sit under the anointing of a pastor because I'm not a pastor, I'm a prophet. Okay, I'm not an evangelist. I know how to share my faith and I know how to win souls, but my anointing is prophetic. So when I need a boost in the evangelism area, uh, then I have to sit under the anointing of an evangelist, okay? Because God don't give no one person all the anointing. God don't give no one person all the revelation. It does not work that way. So I'm saying all that to say why you have got to, in your life, you have got to study the written word of God. That's the Bible. But you have to know Jesus, which is the God of the Bible. And you have to get the third one. You have to get the rhema word from God. So the fact that God wants you to have a house is in the scripture. I'll give you houses you didn't build, vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant. But which house is mine comes through the prophetic. The Holy Ghost will give you a witness. You go visit this house, you say, I'm not feeling this. You go visit the second house, you say, I'm not feeling this. You go visit the third house and the Holy Ghost hits you. And the tongues come out and you get that, that rush 
that the Holy Ghost gives, you get that anointing, you get that witness where you understand the Lord said I'm supposed to live here. That's the rhema word. That's not in the scripture. That comes straight from the Holy Ghost. The fact that the Holy Ghost does it is in the scripture. Okay, the spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The spirit of God doth quicken your mortal body. That's in the Bible. But the experience of it connected to a particular thing is particular to you. So I'm laboring on this point to help you understand that even though we're in a year of Jubilee and even though we're in a season of refreshing, you have to ask the Lord, what does that mean for me? Don't take what I'm saying and just go all off and run off on the deep end and start quitting your job and getting a divorce and doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff because you heard the prophet say it was a season of refreshing in a year of Jubilee. That's the wrong thing to do. Did you hear me? <laughs> That's the wrong thing to do is to go all off. That's the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is to hear the word of God coming through the prophetic and then take that same word back to the Lord and say, now, Jesus, please tell me how to apply this to me. What's the refreshment for me? What's the jubilee in this year for me? What do you want me to do? And if you do it that way, then the Lord can give you the specific instructions to show you how to get into your refreshing, how to get into your jubilee. Now, do you see why I work so hard to destroy that genie concept of God? How, you might have done it. I know you've seen, if you've been in church more than five minutes, I know you've seen it. Uh, you might have done it yourself. I know I have till I learn better. But if you haven't done it, I know you've seen it to where the Holy Ghost falls and passes preaching and the spirit of God is high and somebody gives a prophetic word that God said it's time to be refreshed and we just fall all out because it's so good. Because when the Lord gives you that corporate group anointing and his glory is in the room and it's sent to refresh you, it's so good. It's so good. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. But then people misinterpret it and go all off on the deep end and say, God told me to divorce my husband. No, he didn't. <laughs> God told me to quit my job. I've seen people buy cars that they couldn't afford because they said the Lord said he's going to do this. If the Lord said he's going to do something, then you have to wait before the Lord and get the instruction <laughs> for what he wants you to do in the something that he's doing. I've seen people go in debt. And they started doing all this stuff because the Lord said, and I remember seeing this one particular person I'm thinking of driving his car that they couldn't afford, that they ended up losing. Because you just went all off on the deep end because you got a promise from God, but you didn't ask him, what does that mean for me? How, how am I supposed to live it out? Because the Lord might have told you, save your money for three more months, and then I'm going to give you a discounted car three months from now. Don't buy the car now. Understand? So that is why you need the written word of God, which is the Bible. You need the living word of God, a personal relationship with Jesus, where you know his voice, you know his ways. But you also need the rhema word of God, the prophetic. You need all three. That's how we're going to manifest this blessing that the spirit of God is opening us to us now. Now, do you understand? That's why I work so hard. That's why I do No More Genies on the second Thursday night, to cut through all that religious uh, misinformation, to cut through all that emotional stuff, to cut through all the stuff that we think it means, but it's not actually what it means. It means what the scriptures say it means. And that's how you maximize it. So if God is not telling you to get married, don't run off and marry your boyfriend this weekend because you heard the prophet say it was a, a year of jubilee and prophet said, I'll get all my stuff. Don't do that. If the Lord didn't tell you to do that, did you hear me? <laughs> don't don't jump the broom this weekend. Don't you run off and elope if the, <laughs> if the Lord is not telling you to. Now, if the Lord tells you to, then go for it. If the Lord tells you, go, this is a weekend for you to get married, go for it. But the point is to go before the Lord and ask Jesus, how does this prophetic word apply to me? And what do you want me to do? That's how you're going to manifest it. That's the way. That's the way. Prophet Taylor, has that ever happened in your life? Yes, it has. Y'all know my testimony about my stickers. 
I tell my stickers testimony all the time. I was working in my office and I was putting together some stuff and I needed some labels, some stickers. And the ones I wanted were really expensive. And I saw them and I was like, oh Lord, I don't want to pay all that money. So one day I was working in my office and the Holy Ghost interrupted me and said, just started poking me. I was like, I'm like, Jesus, what you doing? So I'm trying to go back to work. And the Lord said, no, get up now. I'm like, what are you talking about get up now? The Lord said, get up now and go to the store. And so I have to be obedient like a child and say, okay, Lord, if you say so. I went to, what was it? It's either, uh, I went to Office Depot. When I walked into Office Depot, not only did they have the stickers I wanted, but they had like buy one, get two free. So I paid for one pack of stickers and walked out that store with three packs. I kid you not. I'm not even making that up. Because I got up and moved when the Holy Ghost told me to move. Because you know they're not going to have a buy one, get two free sale going on for very long. You know, it's rare that they give you that kind of deal. So the Lord said, get up and go to Office Depot now. And I did. And there was a, another additional discount. I think there was even a discount on the retail price. All I know was when I looked at that, that what I was paying and what I had easily $150 worth of stickers for less than 30 bucks. <laughs> I'm telling you. So that's what I mean when I say, yes, I have done this. Yes. Yes, it really does work. And that is all the more reason why you got to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost, why you got to know the voice of the Lord, okay? So that when he's telling you, don't buy the house this week, buy the house next week. When he's telling you, don't buy the car this month, wait till September. And September rolls around and you find that very car you wanted and it's 50% off. That's the kind of stuff the Lord will do for you if you learn how to listen. All right. All right. That's our teacher for tonight. Thank you so much. This is No More Genies 38. Uh, I come on the second Thursday of every month, 7 o'clock uh, p.m. Central Standard Time, because uh, it was in my heart uh, to create a program that specifically addressed all these wrong ideas we learned in church and all this wrong religious teaching that has messed us up. And God is married to the wrong person, living in the wrong house, driving the wrong thing, because we didn't understand. You can't go off on the deep end when you get a word from God. you got to listen for instructions. You can't ever realize the promises of God apart from God. People that think you can are religious people. People that know you can't have relationship. And I'm not going to move until the Lord tells me to move. Because that's what a blessing is going to be. All right. Amen and amen. So my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach because whenever God gives a prophetic word, I believe as many Christians, uh, unbelievers too, as many believers and unbelievers as possible need to hear it. Because it's, uh, that prophetic word, many times that the spirit of God speaks directly to you and lets you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is speaking to you through that prophetic word. So every video, I told you I was going to ask you to do one thing for me to help me increase my reach this year. So what I want you to do with this video is share it on, on as many pages as you can. There's apostolic and prophetic pages on Facebook. Share it on that. If you're part of your church group or if you're part of anything with the apostolic and prophetic, please share this video on that page because this teaching was about getting away from that genie concept and walking in the refreshing of God and walking in the year of Jubilee as we learn to obey God in that. So this needs to be shared as many places we can where they're talking about the apostolic or the prophetic. So I want you to do one thing. That's the one thing I want you to do for me is share this video in those spaces on Instagram, on Facebook, and then I'm going to have this YouTube video up in about 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. That's it for tonight. I will see you Sunday at my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my weekly live prophetic word. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan said done. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much, my brother. So I will see you Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. 
for the next weekly live prophetic word. All right. Amen. And God bless. And remember, it's time to listen to the Lord so we can get refreshed. And it's time to listen to the Lord so we can walk into our personal year of Jubilee. Amen.